Welcome to the Reptiles and Research podcast. Now, today's guest is Jennifer Angela Rhodes. She has a master's in animal welfare and ethics and then law. Honestly, she could, she gave us a really, really highly intellectual conversation. Jen, someone that is highly, highly intelligent and highly qualified, but yet so casual. And it's a really enjoyable dynamic where someone is just so relaxed and just so normal but also highly qualified and able to have this like really really high level conversation so this podcast episode is really relaxed and conversational and we go into ethics and some questionable areas of asking people to question their own thoughts and feelings that are quite challenging so i think it's a really worthwhile episode i really enjoyed it i have certainly shaped some new opinions for myself after being a part of this conversation and I think some people might benefit from it as well. So without further ado, let's welcome Jennifer Angela Rhodes. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Jennifer. Obviously, you're someone who is qualified in welfare and obviously welfare is a big part of this podcast. We're very excited to have a conversation about some of the things that most people don't want to talk about and that's pretty much why this channel even exists so could you just give us a little rundown of like who you are and how you came into the world of welfare uh well my name is jennifer um i actually came into the world of where welfare through exotics um it was quite so many years ago now i've been in the exotics hobby uh oh, i think 12 years now um and there started to be a really big boom in um animal companies you know the ones that show the animals off um and encounters animal interaction companies um and i've done a couple of you know working for a few of those and i noticed that there's quite a severe lack of legislation at that time um there was a severe lack of legislation the only thing that was actually in place was the um performing animals register from 1925 um which was way out of date and not fit for use uh, so I decided to go down the animal welfare route on that aspect to try and make a difference because the welfare of the animals being used at that time, um, you could definitely identify some issues and problems, especially with length of transport and what they're transported in and uh, zoonotic diseases and stuff like that. Um, so I decided to do an animal welfare and behaviour degree, um, Bachelor's of Science uh, for three years. Uh, and managed to go out with um first class honors with that yes thank you very much nice I nice <laughs> uh, i wouldn't do it again ruin my life but never mind <laughs> <laughs> and then after that um because i always wanted to focus on exotic species um, what i really wanted to do was uh, become an animal welfare consultant and it's quite difficult to get into because it doesn't really exist as a as a as a protected title uh, so anyone can be an animal welfare consultant um, there are quite you know a few of them around who don't have the qualifications to back it up but there are also a lot of them who are ex experts so that's where they have their experience from but not necessarily within um exotics um so i, I thought well I'll, I'll try and fill this niche uh, and go go down this way um, and then so i decided to do my um, animal welfare science ethics and law uh, masters uh, just to top me up to be a bit more specific and um that was a pretty decent course again didn't really focus in exotics it mainly focused in um uh you know like cattle sheep animal agriculture sort of things and animal uh, animal ethics and that side but it really did open my eyes a lot more especially the ethics side uh, in understanding uh, the different ethical viewpoints that there are, more understanding of animal rights, more understanding of uh, utilitarianism and um, speciesism and things like that. So uh, an all around mix. And since then, um, I've mainly been working within licensing. So I help people get their DWA licenses or zoo licenses. Uh, any of the animal licenses, I can, I can do anything to do with the uh, animal activities licenses. Um, is kind of my speciality uh, and I've been quite successful with that uh, whenever people have actually needed licenses it's few and far between so um, you get you get good experience from it and I've managed to get at least uh, three, D, three, D, three DWA licenses and two zoo licenses so far 
um, and those are just the ones that I've been a part of. But I also do um, expert opinions for local authorities. So I work quite closely with Nuneaton as a, with their animal welfare officer as well, who's less confident with the exotics, whereas I am. So um, it's a good working relationship in that aspect. So I'm free to just drift around and do pretty much whatever I want. So how did, obviously you did as masters and obviously yeah. you were a pet keeper before that. How did that yeah. affect how you governed your hobby and how you felt about your hobby? The first month of that um, uh, masters, again, ruined my life. The cognitive dissonance that I had was massive and it made me realise what was wrong and not necessarily you know what's wrong and what's right but things that I had um convinced myself were right in my own morals that turned out that that couldn't be possibly true so ethics has to be consistent there is there is you do have to have consistency in ethics um and you have to face some very uncomfortable truths in that in that aspect and once you face them and you can um talk about it and you know go around it you you you, you come to your, your own conclusion um and that's what a lot of people don't do they stick with the cognitive dissonance and they don't add that extra level and animal ethics is a key part of animal welfare you cannot have animal welfare without animal ethics and if you don't know animal ethics then you can't possibly know animal welfare so you have to have um, them both together animal welfare science provides the science uh, which is much much needed and animal ethics provides the philosophy which gives you the why you have to have the why not just the how otherwise you don't have a complete a complete answer i'm thinking when we go into all of this I might just be like, my knowledge is solely welfare. So I'd be interested to pick your brain on the ethics side. But before we go into all of this, you touched upon cognitive dissonance. Can we just define what that is? Cognitive dissonance is, oh, I don't know, to try and put a definition on it right now is difficult. Um, when you have a preconceived notion, a belief, and um, it's basically it, it's a false belief so even it's something that you can believe it but 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 the basis of it is false it's not true necessarily so um you your your brain tries to protect you from it everybody has their brain as as a as a moral species as 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 we are uh, as we are social we we want to be moral as as moral as possible and when you're faced with the truth that that you know what you're doing may not be actually moral uh, rather than accepting it it just divorces from it and no no it's not possible I, I can't be immoral that's 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 bad and bad is so we carry on in a false belief rather than facing the truth that what we're doing may not exactly be the most moral option and you see that a lot in the hobby a lot in any in any kind of animal keeping any not just pets anything we have to do with animals at all is is a lot of it has a, has a lot of based on on false beliefs if that makes sense i think i think uh, my understanding of it a really good example would be like eating meat and the welfare and the ethics of yes. slaughter and stuff or even yeah. just like our frozen food um for our snakes we switch that off and go la 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 and, and not look into it and think about it because we don't want to face it but yeah. we all know the realities like the conditions the roads are kept in and the the way that euthanasia the euthanasia is done but we all like switch it off and that's, yes. I think that's a good example yeah it, it, it is and again this is my own opinions but um being on the course as well learning the animal ethics side um i cannot justify myself eating meat uh, even as a utilitarian, um, there is no solid justification for, for, for eating meat other than for pure hedonistic pleasure. And I do it because I enjoy doing it. And that is the only um, a reason that I have for doing it. So really, I should be 
at least vegetarian, vegan, preferably, but vegetarian. I'm not um, because I'm quite hypocritical in that sense. So to kind of, um, I say, as I say, ethics has to be consistent because I am eating animals for nothing other than my own pleasure. I can't necessarily um, be against any other form with with to do with animals. So I can't be against circuses. I can't be against um, keeping animals in, you know, I can't be against any of that because I have taken the absolute fundamental right of or interest in, in utilitarianism of living, of life, and I'm taking that right away from another sentient being purely for my own pleasure. So I cannot have, I cannot say anything else is wrong. Does that make sense? So when I'm not against, I can't be against things, but I can provide evidence for and against it, if that, if that makes sense. But I cannot specifically come out and say, well, 100% that is wrong because I am doing the very first wrong thing in that sense. Again, just my opinion. That's how. That's how. Um. That's the what I had to come to the conclusion of when I first, obviously, when I was doing the course, and it took quite a while for me to accept it. But um, it, when once you get there, you do you do see the bigger picture. It's a lot better. Can you just define the difference between welfare and then go into defining animal rights and then defining ethics as well, and how they all are all parts of a triangle? Yeah. So animal welfare as a whole, um, is the physical and a mental state of an animal in relation to the conditions that it lives or dies. Um, that's just a general, there is no 100% definition. Um, everyone's kind of got their own little one, but what it is always is multimodal. So there is always different parts that, that come together to create the one. It is a holistic approach um, in terms of animal welfare. The, I say the, what we use in, in the UK, especially in the law, is um, the five freedoms, um, as, as you're both aware of, of what those are. I prefer the five domains from Mella. I think that's a much better, uh, a much better way of being able to, to assess animal welfare as a whole. Um, so that's, that's your, that's your, your, your basis. That's the subject that it's on. Then you come to obviously animal ethics uh, and that's the philosophical side of it so um you are looking at the explanations and the reasons to why uh rather than the science part which is more of uh, science is very methodical um it has to be measurable observable repeatable um and that's what a lot of you know scientific evidence is based on but it doesn't give you the why why am i doing this what's going you know why is it important why should we be doing this why should i care that's not what the science gives you that's um science just gives you the the data um so you will already be doing animal ethics uh because you have to <laughs> to be able to do the science um but it's just that extra little bit and then from animal ethics you have your different ethical viewpoints so one of those is animal rights one of those is utilitarianism um these will change vary to country but um for as is uh, utilitarianism animal rights uh um, De deontological no, that's part of animal rights. Oh, okay. The ontological is a, that's just another another that fo focuses on consequence, uh, focuses on the actions. So uh, uh, the the two biggest ones that we have in the UK is obviously animal rights and utilitarianism. Um, the other ones, speciesism and um, oh god, well, I can't remember any of them. There's there's a few others as well. Uh, some of them are absolutely ridiculous. Um, but that's not for me to say because it's an ethical viewpoint and everyone's entitled to it on their own point. Um, ethics in general is will cover, um, so ethics will cover the population of things and, and morals is your own individual compass. So all of our, in England, our uh, ethics are based on Christianity. That's just where from, from the beginning, they're, they're based around Christianity. Uh, and our view of animals is based around Christianity as well. So from the origins and in the Bible, when it says God created man and, and, and animals for man, that's where we first started in Christianity. Many, many religions before that um, that have many 
uh, that have dealt with animals that have a completely different view. But in the UK, as is based around Christianity, so that's what I have to go go by. So the, your morals is your own moral compass of right and wrong, and ethics is like a societal, like overarching agreement of it. Yes, as a, as a social species, we are very very uh, based in ethics and morals. Uh, so much so that apparently, if you put newborn babies on an island and they manage to survive, they would create their own society of ethics and morals as well because because we are a social species that's exactly how we've maintained our social status and how we've benefited from it everyone benefits from being uh in in a society so we have to follow those uh i say we have to some people don't but then there's consequences uh and we kick them out of societal aspects so we have our overarching and then your morals will be more guided from family, friends, uh, experience in life sort of thing. So they're two different things, but they usually relate. It just depends, obviously, on, on circumstances and situations at the time. Is it a bit of a misnomer that people use the two interchangeably? Yes, it's, a, it's also a misnomer that when people use um, animal welfare and animal rights as as opposite sides they're not um animal rights is just an, a part of animal ethics it's an ethical viewpoint so people what people usually are um associating with animal welfare is actually utilitarianism rather than there isn't something called new welfareism um, which in, in in the U in the usa is mainly um they use it as a but it, that actually came from animal rights and it's where they slowly phase out um animal use uh, uh, rather than the complete abolition so you have your different parts of let's say you know how you've got different parts of utilitarianism you have different parts of animal rights you have different parts of each one has its own little shoot off and, li and that one will have its own little shoot off and that's how um that's why it gets gets quite confusing i think when people um assume that it's either well thought welfare or animal rights and i always have this conversation where i'm like well all of us prescribe some level of rights to animals otherwise yeah. you wouldn't care yeah. about animal welfare so it's not they aren't opposing because if i stood next to you and i beat the shit out of your dog that's how it's yeah you are affording some level of right that i that, that has the right to not have the shit kicked out of it so you think you don't have any animal rights in you but you do it's just a what level of the gradient to, you're on to what that's where it, it split off utilitarianism and animal rights aren't necessarily that different um it, it, the original people tom reagan and um peter singer very good friends very very good friends um fantastic people to argue with i've never done it but they really are bloody good uh, so you peter singer coined the utilitarianism and obviously tom tom reagan went was animal rights and that's only recently new 1975 we're not talking quite quite far back um whereas utilitarianism a little bit further back uh for john mills and um jeremy bentham um they kind of it, he, he came up with a utilitarianism for people uh, but he did write a very small paragraph uh, about animals uh, and i don't know whether you've ever heard of the quote um it's on my arm, so I'm just going <laughs> to look. Uh, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Why well, should the short arm of the law protect? Only and that's specifically part of one of his one of his books. Um, and that's kind of when we started to include animals in the conversations. But we, we didn't have the internet and shit back then, so it was done over hundreds of years through very long um methods of pieces of paper imagine having to write an argument and have to wait months to hear back like I, I i couldn't do it i couldn't do it i'd need an answer now but that's how uh and, and obviously things get changed chinese whispers and things like that there as, as, as it goes on and it's, it's only really 1975 then where we really started to look into animal rights and and utilitarianism so it's new it's relatively new do you think that animal rights plays any role in how we 
guidance and how we um, evolve as reptile keepers. That people do naturally, but don't realize they're doing. Oh yes, yes. Uh, the basis, obviously, of animal rights is um, you have your something called non-utilitarian and trumping um, events. So it's the as I'll use it as rights: the right to life, the right to liberty, um, and the right to freedom. I think, and those are your th your three non-utilitarian. So nothing can trump those rights. Um, whereas that's where we're, the, the the basis that we have, um, and we use that quite a lot um, in 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 keeping reptiles. The right the right to life. It has the right to live. Um, you can't just go and 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 kill it because you want to kill it. And people feel that deeply. No one will just go and 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 beat uh, a, a reptile or, or something like that. Well, I'm hoping most people won't just do that um, because they they actually give the animal a state moral status. So you have to give something moral status to be able to consider it. Um, and a moral status means that you're just doing things. Um, oh, God, this is so hard to explain. It's really easy when other people do it, but when I'm doing it, um, <laughs> when you give something moral status, you're giving it its own, you're doing what a punter hit based on its own interests. So you're not kicking the shit out of a dog because you know that dog will feel pain. And because you have felt pain before, you can um, relate to that animal feeling pain. So you won't kick the shit out of it specifically because that animal feels pain un unto its own right. Whereas before, especially in law, um, animals were seen as property. So you couldn't hurt an animal because it hurts the animal. You could only hurt somebody's property. So you're hurting the human who owns it, not the animal itself. When we changed that and gave it um, animal's moral status, um, that's when the law as well changed. Um, with the new Animal Welfare Act 2006, that's when we gave them moral status. So now we don't kick the shit out of things because it's going to hurt them rather than because I'm going to hurt you as the owner. Do you find, this is my own viewpoint, and I want to see what your thoughts are. I find there's a lot of extremities in this industry, this hobby, whatever you want to call it, where it's either very, very utilitarian, um or people view anything more as like really animal rights yes in fact i mean a lot of the times it's not even utilitarian i've completely forgotten the word his name is carl cohen and if you look at some of his stuff he's adorable um and he tries he tries really hard but what he says is just not it doesn't hit the mark um and i'm trying to remember what the word is for that specific bloody type of um, animal ethics whereas basically it's based on a contract and and you can do whatever you want to animals is basically that 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 kind of point and that is how i view the hobby to be honest is that i'm going to keep this because it's my right to keep this animal and they don't take into consideration the animal and its needs and its welfare and its mental state and its physical state it's just based on they're taking away our right to keep this animal do you see what i mean it's always based on you owning something and not based on moral the moral status of the animal itself yeah that i often find that they talk about them not as an individual but as this is a I don't know, bearded dragon, and I like bearded dragon, opposed to this is Gary the bearded dragon and his needs yeah. are, if that makes sense. It does, and when that change, that should change, I say it does change and it should change, when people start to view their own animals. So rather than, um, I mean, that's when animal rights really kicks in, especially with people, Um is when they start to remember their own selves. 
And this is not just now a bearded dragon, this is my bearded dragon. So we quantify our responsibilities towards things that are closest to us. So my dog will mean more to me than somebody else's dog. And so I have more of a responsibility and towards my animal than, than that other person's animal. But really, when you're both of those animals have equal rights. It's non, you know, that they have the same moral standing. They have the same. But to me, mine means more because it would do. And it's the same with people. My mom means more to me than, you know, somebody else's mom across the world. But they have exactly the same ethical value. They have the same value. We just view it differently. So taking away something as an overall right, they um, they do try to uh, appeal to the masses in that sense. And um, it's not effective. I mean, it's effective in scaremongering and it's effective in um, its interesting language and it, people pay attention to it, but it completely devalues the life of the animals who are involved in it all. So where did this leave your relationship with your own hobby then? I came out of it. Um, I stopped. I kept what I had and carried it on. Uh, but now I don't really keep. I've got some inverts um, and I've got two snakes. Um, but other than that, oh, I've got spider as well. It's usually things that are rescued, you know, just not, I hate the word rescue, but it's what somebody doesn't want anymore or dumped at a shop and I just, I can pick it up and I have two snakes. That's it. Um, so you have your pets, but you don't consider yourself an active hobbyist. Not anymore. No, no. And that wasn't necessarily the animal ethics side. That was more to do with the hobby itself, just being exhausting and it ruined the joy. It ruined the joy. And, and then obviously the animal ethics ruined the joy on top of that. So all I had left was cheese. And that <laughs> ruined as well. By the end. So. so when it comes to welfare, how, how did you view your own hobby and then what you could do and how you felt about things? There's a lot of bad. There is good. There is some really good. And I'm glad that I know the good. But when you're looking at the problem, you have to look at it outside of the box as an overall problem. And when you're, we're not talking about, you know, your fantastic um, setups behind us. When you're talking about the hobby in general, not that, you know, all of it is mainly going to be low welfare. It's going to be the ones keeping in racks. It's going to be the ones um, that don't understand uh reptile welfare or reptile behavior or they see them as lesser animals because obviously they're further down the social zoological scale than mammals or birds so they don't believe that they have the emotional capacity to to be able to play or any of that you know so they suffer greatly and because they're made to withstand harsh conditions they suffer greatly for a very long time before they actually die this is what um, Liam and I were having a conversation about is in I work in rescues and um, I work with dogs and they very obviously when they're in distress, you see a lot of really upsetting behaviours. These emotions that they feel are felt the same in our reptiles, but they sit there silently because yes. they're not screaming or yeah. showing all of these horrific behaviours that can happen, like self-mutilation, all of that kind of thing. We think that it's fine. Oh, yeah, it's just sat there. No, internally, it's really not okay. And it it's makes it harder. It's not okay. Yeah. Internally, it's screaming. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah. The homeostasis is off completely, and it will be suffering, but it's not screaming out loud. So they're just saying, oh. And then you have, uh, you know, the anthropomorphism on the opposite side of saying, oh, it looks sad when it's got no eyebrows. How can you tell that it looks sad? So you have to be in the middle. and. The hobby, I say, I don't know how it is at the moment, but it used to be that they were both ends of the spectrum. You couldn't be in between. You were either completely and totally, that's not scientific. You can't prove that it's got no, you know, it's got no feelings, it, it, you know. And then there's 
the opposite side of the animal rights side of just completely emotive language of that's so sad it must hate its life sort of thing and there was no in between i am um, neither either i've been wandering down the track of like sentience um because for me i can't find a good definition because you ask one like group of society and they'll be like sentience is um like knowing their selves like their reflection they have an individual like identity to sentience could just be feeling what's your take on sentience so sentience is literally the capacity to be able to experience uh, pleasurable and negative experiences that's all sentience is then the higher part is consciousness so to understand itself and its place in the world and things like that that is consciousness so um in 2013 uh, there was a cambridge um it was a Cambridge stuff on, on sentience and a load of neuroscience uh, so neuroscientists came and um, Stephen Hawking, he was cool, and others. And they basically came up with um, a relevant definition of sentience and came to the conclusion that all animals um, up to invertebrates and including some invertebrates have the... Uh, abilities to be sentient so at that point then we considered all animals up to invertebrates and some sorry my cat's just about to attack me sure, my bit of dragon sat on my foot on my foot burn mr jingles <laughs> go away <laughs> um, he um so all I, we consider all animals to be sentient now up to certain um insects so cephalopods definitely crustaceans i would argue for uh anything else i think should just be given benefit of the doubt is that where there's the, the science and there's the ethics so the science yeah. is like measuring and trying to prove it and then the ethics is like yeah. personally i think the eth my my own thoughts is that it should be given the benefit of doubt and then science is there to try and prove otherwise not you, ha you not it doesn't have it and then then you prove it later on because otherwise you could treat something horrifically because you don't think it it matters only to find out later that you abused it rather than give it the benefit of doubt and then like oh well i never i never did anything bad because they all did more than absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence um so that's why you have to give it the benefit of the doubt there are yeah. um a lot of animal ethics is related uh, to human ethics as well. So you you can have a human being who who has no capability of verbal communication at all, doesn't, you know, blind, deaf, mute, can't do anything. Do they not have rights? So you, we would give them exactly the same rights as we have um, because we understand that they can be full. We have, we can't be sure that they feel pain. We can't be sure that, but we give them the benefit of the doubt and the same as I'm looking at you, I don't know how you feel. I don't know what your pain feels like. I don't know how you love, but I love and I feel pain. So I can only assume that you do. I don't know that you're actually, you could be a robot. I don't, I don't have evidence for it. Do you know what I mean? It's not some, well, illegal evidence. I could try and cut you open and that, but we can't do that. So we just have to trust in that sense that, I love the same way that you love and our values are exactly the same. The way that I love is no different to the way that you love and my happiness should be of equal value to the happiness of an animal because they are being as happy as much as they can be. That's the highest value that you can get just because it's different to mine doesn't mean that it's it's less. I think there might be a few people that watch this and that they, they go like, oh, that's, that's so fluffy and a lot of this might go over their heads. They do. And I think what's happened is mechanomorphism has taken grip, grip yes. in this hobby. Mm -hmm. They're so fearful of anthropomorphism that they go to the far other extreme and apply these like mechanical autonomous on uh, characteristics yeah. to animals when actually it's, it's in the center yeah. but because we're in the center talking about these things they look from the extre extremity and assume it means you're the other extremity in your animal rights rather Which than you're dead I, in the center yeah. that's why i just stopped with the hobby it was just not worth my time it wasn't worth it trying to argue points especially benefit of the doubt is hard and 
um, trying to get people to care why you should do this for them is even harder. So I was left between a rock and a hard place and just decided it's not at the right place that I want to be at. So I'll just go off and enjoy my own little, my own little way. It's actually a lot. I say a lot better. Um, in the exotic mammal side and the exotic bird side is actually, uh, they're far more open to benefit of the doubt than the, than the reptile side is, which is understandable, you know, lower down the social zoological scale, but we have plenty plenty of evidence um for reptiles playing um for reptiles experiencing happiness for um bonding especially in crocodilians um for for motherly bonds as well um it would make sense uh, evolutionary for species who are monogamous to have love it would make sense because that's how you stay together. That's how you remember each other. That's how you know how you why you don't go off other places. It, it would make sense for them to be a bond. Whether it's our love is not important. It doesn't matter. They're not us. We're not them. So it doesn't matter. But we can still take that into consideration when we're talking about their lives and how they're kept in captivity. It's very important for that. I think so. it's, it's 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 a roundabout way of something like love in humans. If you describe what love means, it's just like a, a chemical response in the brain to a stimulus, and the overarching it's... feeling is what we call love. But if you describe a chemical stimulus in a reptile's brain in response to a sim- stimulus, people are like makes sense, cool. But because the words are used as a descriptor for that process. Um, yeah you where just just because you might call it something that we might use it for something else in our own subjective feelings people will be like oh no 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 but in reality if you were to show i don't know if there's science for this or not i don't know my own knowledge doesn't know but if if the same process happens in both brains then it's is 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 not the process there full stop that's the point that's the the, when um the they get a confusion as well between emotions and feelings so the feeling is the subjective part and we will never know what what capacity they have in that sense uh, because we we physically can't i will never know how you subjectively experience things you will never know how i subjectively experience things it's not possible to know but whereas we can see the uh, biological stimulus impact the change in chemical levels the the whack, whacking out of homeostasis we can see the physical scientific side but we cannot see the other side but it would so you have to have an argument of why it would make sense for for it to be there and that's where the ethics comes into it philosophy is the rationality rather than not relying on the science so if you take the science out we still need the rationality there to be able to, to to accept it it's difficult to um, prove things as facts. There is very little in this world that can be considered an absolute truth. Very, very little. Um, you'd be surprised what it takes to prove something as a true. Um, so it's it's not black and white. It's very grey and multicoloured. And you can go through different parts and then have your mind change when evidence comes out differently. But they're not open to that that's not what they're open to they're not open to the evidence or the scientific reasoning or the justifications and that's where their cognitive because their cognitive dissonance they don't want to face the reality of what they might be doing is wrong so well, they don't face it this is the thing with like the whole they don't need more than a whole to crawl up in and hide so giving them all of this extra stuff is pointless so like I would rather be on the, I gave them more than they needed and they never used it, than they needed yeah. more and I never gave it. But Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. But it, it, that's, that's the, it, there's a problem, especially in zoos as well, um, where 
they think captivity is this fantastic, amazing thing. And, well, you know, why would they want anything different? They've got food on demand. They've got, you know, when in reality, every choice that that animal can make is taken away from them. And choice is incredibly important for uh, well-being, really important um, to have the ability to be able to choose something and even small decisions, what they want to eat that day, you can choose between two different things. That's still giving, you know, giving them the option and they have none of that. And they seem to think that that being in captivity is this fantastically great thing. And in reality, it's not as good as what they think it is. Uh, and there was a really good um, experiment, the happiness thought machine or something um of where if I could put you in a room and hook you up to a machine and you are given everything that you will ever need you know you will you will always be happy on this machine uh but you will just live in this room on your own in on this machine would you choose it would you want to be on this machine for the rest of your life experiencing nothing but joy and happiness uh, never needing to eat or drink or you know it's all done for you would you choose it over I no 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 nor would I because the bad parts are what makes life as well you you everyone suffers to certain degrees there's different kinds of stress you have good stress bad stress you know it's those little things and those little choices are what make life and when it comes down to us, of, of would you be in that situation? Most people say no, they wouldn't want to be in that situation. So I don't know why they think that that an animal would want to be in that situation either. We are animals. We are just different species. I just want to circle back and then like bluntly define things, just because I know it might yeah, go that's... past a few people. So the the this. So emotion is something that can be measured in scientific. With it, I'm assuming that the definition definition of emotion we're using is the chemical reaction in the, in the brain and in, yes. in the body. Yeah, and the then the biological response is, for stimuli. And then the feeling is the perception subjective. of what that is. Yeah. Yes, completely subjective uh, feeling. Um, like my pain might be your pleasure, and your pleasure might be my pain. So you can have the same biological response to something and people can interpret that completely different so that's why it's really difficult to to hone in on 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 proving that because we can't prove it in ourselves this is the whole thing with like um perception of pain and the response to pain not only in the body but in the brain for example fish have less of a status for because they have pain, but it only reacts the same as like any other stimuli that might respond in fear. Therefore, yes. they are less on the scale than us because we have yeah. a response internally to it. Yes. Right? Yeah, but the, the, the only reason we're at the top, obviously, is because of our complex language. Yeah. The ability to be able to, be able to, to convey information to each other. And that's what we've needed for our own species, you know, other species have different ways of dealing with things where language wouldn't be appropriate. Um, uh, many set, uh, um, cetaceans, they need a different kind of language because they're fucking far apart from each other. Like shouting Dave is not going to get the other one back. So they need a different kind of communication. Uh, but we just take our own um our own way that we measure intelligence and just assume this is it, this is pinnacle, this is top, this is how we do it. And it's mainly based on language, art and discrimination. Um, I'm not really artistic. I'm not, I mean, I'm very not artistic. I don't really give a shit if a crow can paint, to be honest. Um, but it can understand the concept of zero. And to be honest, even that to me is like, so fucking what? Big, big whoop, so can I. But it's really big in in an animal brain that doesn't have the same um, the bumps, and the nodules in, in the brain. So it, that to be able to see that it understands the concept of zero and doesn't have the same brain that we have, 
opens up a new world of wow what else can they experience that just because they don't have the same kind of brain than us they must still be able to have the ability to do these things and that breaks the walls of of animal behavior and uh, animal welfare and introduces new new things and it's really it's cool it's really dead cool because the emotions in reptiles has been scientifically been proven for a long yes. time now. Yes, I mean, there's papers has. from the 90s of like royal pythons and there's dopamine. Papers from the 60s um, of um, tortoises playing because a, a play behavior is literally just a behavior that doesn't have any kind of um, function to it. It's not for survival. It's not for for the. It's not for the the, the four Fs. And if it's not for the four Fs, then it's a play behavior it's considered so you know going up on a slide sliding down and then going back up and doing it again i mean if there's the choice to do in other things and it still continues to do that then then we can kind of say well maybe that is a play behavior and it would make sense brains are amazing things things get bored they get bored so they make up their own little fun sometimes that comes out as a uh, stereotypical behaviors which you see quite a bit in captivity and sometimes stereotypical behaviors are not bad it depends on how they affect the animal well what is so, a high level conversation now isn't it it's difficult isn't it it's negative for us because we see it and it makes us uncomfortable but in that moment that animal might be in a positive state because that's it's what comforting itself. that's the whole point of why it's doing it is is as a coping mechanism to, to self-soothing comfort. yeah so you you definitely see it in um uh so things like elephants um, that have been in smaller, smaller enclosures, smaller places. You see them rocking backwards and forwards, and and bears especially when they're brought to an enclosure, a bigger enclosure. That's not necessarily uh, what they need immediately. They need to be gradually in, in, introduced to a larger enclosure so it doesn't, you know, go completely mad. Um, but you'll still see them doing the same repetitive behaviours, and it's comforting for them. So it's not causing them any physical harm. Um, they don't necessarily need to be stopped because uh, all you're doing is just stopping it from comforting itself. So not all stereotypical behaviours are, are bad uh, in that sense, but uh, you know, as long as you can see where it's come from and it's not blatantly down to husbandry issues. This is a very new thing, isn't it? Because it very much it was like stereotypical behaviour is bad, we need to limit it. And now there's yeah, a lot of new thought of the way it's actually self-comforting and the grey area starts to come out. We do it We do it a lot, a lot. Have you ever been to um, the vets when one of your animals is sick and you're pacing backwards and forwards? in the vets that's a stereotypical behavior and you're doing it as a, as, as a way to comfort and it does it does it has its purpose it has a, there's a reason for doing it uh, and if somebody just grabbed you and sat you down and stopped you from doing that it doesn't necessarily help the situation it can make it worse because your outlet has been taken away from you so oh, i saw that then little boop on the floor <laughs> can you hear it can you just that once, only that once. Yeah, she just laps. Bless and you. she has the choice. Yeah, I built a ramp for her to come in and out. Exactly. She has the choice to be able to do that, and that's very important uh, to, to, to give to her. Because there will be people in the hobby who say, oh, it's outside of its environment, you shouldn't allow it to do that, this is terrible, and things like that. When, no, you, you're quite clearly giving it the choice, and it is, you know, she's decided... That's where she wants to be. She's come and gone three, uh, twice. Uh, no, once. She came. We let her out during this call. She's gone back, bathed for a bit, and she's come out again now. So that yes. whole entire thing is self-regulation. Exactly. Paradigm of choice. Exactly. Although she slips on this floor. I need to get a rug for her so she gets traction. But for the most part, she is that element of choice. But that is also, um, this is not something really abnormal as well. It is for like you're looking at the broad scale of like the UK hobby, but there is a lot, a new movement of like um, choice control and being allowed to free roam, especially with snakes. Now there's entire yeah. YouTube channels dedicated to it. And um, our friend, Lori Torini has like carpet pythons. She just lets them roam for like weeks. She's like, I've not seen my bridles for like three weeks now. I should probably go find it. And I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Let them, they bugger off. They do what they want. When snakes escape, we, they, they, as long as there is a somewhere for them to go back to, mm. um, you know, like open viv with with heat in there if if necessary. It's that's where the higher welfare comes into it. 
in my personal opinion. That's where we will start to increase on higher welfare because in terms, I, I kind of feel like the enclosure size to a certain degree is a moot point um, because you can never get as big as what it could be. You will never reach the pinnacle in that. So when you start, okay, well, we've got as far as we can with this. Let's start offering choices. That's where the increase in welfare will happen where it decides, actually, I, I want to piss off outside for a bit. I want to go and do some scoots around the carpet and then I'll come back. And that's where we're going to see higher welfare rather than arguing over should a snake be able to lift its fucking head up. Yeah, like, I think it's difficult because when you take someone out of the reptile hobby and you explain to them, oh, yeah, so we are um, deciding whether or not we should have the minimum that the snake can be the length of the viv. You're like, pardon? Yeah. Like, the animal can live in a box the same length as it, yes. But that's something that's being argued. It's like, uh, do you realise how bad that sounds? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even us in houses, you know, it's still bigger than we are long, uh, unless you're really long, I suppose, but... That's normally houses are smaller than, you know, you know we're smaller than houses in, in that sense. And and we can drive ourselves crazy in a house, being in the same four walls and not having the ability. Again, it's all down to choice, not having the, the choice of being able to go out. Lockdown, I've never been so defiant in my life. I've never wanted to be outside more in my life, not because I wanted to, but because I was told I couldn't. And that's when I thought, no, Fuck you, Boris. I stand in my garden for a bit. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that I mean, it was hard. It, Those two years were hard. Yeah, I'm quite reclusive, and I'm I'm, I'm quite um um. Oh, I don't know what I'd say. Not loner, but I'm very like comfortable with my own company. So lockdown yeah. was not a struggle for me whatsoever because I just enjoyed the internet and video games and whatnot and i was yeah. fine but it, it depends on who you are doesn't it i went crazy yeah. <laughs> i went i had both it was fine and then i went crazy because um i mean i've always had anxiety for quite a while severe anxiety so it kind of fed my anxiety of don't go outside because there's death so you got to stay inside and that's where you're safer and then it got to the point then where my um uh, pathological demand avoidance kicked in as a part of the adhd and i got bored of following the rules I didn't break the rules because uh, I haven't got anyone to go and see. So, but um, I really wasn't happy then in in the house, and I had to I had to get out. Uh, discovered the very expensive hobby of gardening instead. It's something you said there, and you said about like, don't go outside. There's death out there. Now, yes. some people um, say like, if there was never snakes in captivity, would you choose to keep one in captivity at the very start? Um, and there's there's one way of looking at which I've I've kind of thought through is that well if you can get to a really high level of welfare this is all ifs on how I feel about things my own morals if I can get to a really high level of welfare and there's lots of paradigms of choice and there's coming and going and they've got that a, a certain level of the illusion of choice shall we say yes um, yeah. well in the wild there's parasites there's disease there's predation. And like, if you look at like even just basic levels of the, the bottom floor of welfare is the avoidance of the freedom from disease. Well, things like that even fall short. So, uh, without keeping them like, like like shit and keeping them really well and big big elaborate enclosures and then being able to come out and do all this training and cooperative care and the paradigm of choice as well, it comes to a certain point. I'm like, would captivity in certain situations be better than the wild if you're eking and working towards increasing more elements of choice as you're going and going i know that's a certain situation not what the baseline of all the yeah. entire industry is but i just want to take a quick break here to talk about our sponsor custom reptile habitats now custom reptile habitats is a great producer of premium pvc enclosures out in the u.s we have some of their enclosures right up here. We also use their conversion kits and they are a great brand that puts animal welfare first. We have regular conversations of custom reptile habitats and recommending different ways to build new kits that actually contributes to the functionality of reptile welfare and they're really committing to try and push the bar. So we're very proud to have them as a sponsor and they help keep this podcast going. So if you want to look at 
more about them, head on over to the description and there'll be a link in the description. Other than that, back to the episode. Yeah, it's it's difficult to say. Um, I mean, in terms of the parasites and, and, you know, being attacked and things like that, that is, that's just a part of life. Um, and we don't have to introduce that in captivity because it makes no sense. But there are other things like stress um, that you can introduce uh, that can be beneficial. Um, so like um, with meerkats and playing the sound of birds or having a, an object fly over them, it it creates stress because they signal, but it means that they then can do their, uh, uh, their behaviours towards it. So they can't express those behaviours without having that stress. So to go through the full variable profile of behaviours, the whole repertoire of behaviours, they have to have the bad stress. But we don't have to give them the shits or yeah. you know, rabies or anything like that. It's not, it's not necessarily in that sense. But you have, to, as an overall arching, I would probably, I probably would say no. Would you? Or is that yeah. me, from my own viewpoint, is that me dipping into utilitarianism to try and justify it? But does utilitarianism justify it? I don't think it does. Um, I don't think the the, the consequences uh, outweigh the, the benefits. What are the benefits of captivity? Overall, so with utilitarianism, you're looking at an overall population. You're not looking at individuals. So overall, in utilitarianism, uh, what are the benefits of keeping captive captive animals? People will argue until they go blue in the face that we're like this protective, like collection, ready to release them back into wild, and that justifies it. No. Like, no, no, it doesn't. No, no it's not, not at all. <laughs> what have we done? We we may have introduced some snails back, and then there was the you know the oryx and uh, the prosoroseski horse. Uh, and some of us, mm, I can't remember what what other There's ones the as Pierre, well. There's a few. Yeah, David's deer that was extinct, and they found like a, a ancient herd that was kept by the emperor for sporting and hunting, mm-hmm. and then they use that as population. Um, and there's a few others as well that I know of. Um, Are those species though? Have they been uh, a cornerstone, key species for their environment, or? Is there a potential that somebody else could have filled that niche? Oh, we're going into a whole different direction. I think a now. lot again, a lot of like, for example, the oryx, they are still in a heavily managed situation. So they're not yeah. ever, we haven't like fixed it. We're still very heavily and got a hand in the population anyway. And so. there are there are a lot of changes that have been rapid changes in environment and geological uh, areas where that species is no longer good for that area so it's it, the world has changed and it's, it's it's gone past when people say about bringing back mammoths bringing them back to what their time has come and gone their niche has been filled by something else uh there's nowhere for them to come back to it's that's what you're going to do with these animals that you're saying that the the i in reality the animals that we keep versus the animals that are released is you know minuscule in percentage for zoos it's minuscule the conservation work is it's debatable it's very debatable um as i say i'm not for or against zoos in any way shape or form they can do what they want but a lot of what it comes down to and what they say i I do actually argue against because it's cognitive dissonance the good that they do is mind you it's it's nothing show me show me what you're doing and why why are you doing this what is the good of you doing this that means that you're able to keep all of these animal lives uh against their will uh you know show me the benefits and all they can say is wow conservation and it's it's but you're not doing anything to put those animals back you're not changing the environment that they can go back into all you're doing is ex ex situ conservation of well, we're breeding them and sending them to other zoos. Oh, okay. What? All right. Yeah. Here's a question for you. So, if we were saying like against their will, 
if you had a dog and you were like released, be gone, but that dog comes back to you, that would be an indication of a, a choice that's choosing to be there. So when you allow a snake to roam, but it comes mm. back to its vivarium, is that choosing that vivarium because it's choosing to be there for the safe space? Well, the same with like with dogs, when you let a dog and it comes back to you, that's not choice, that's more conditioning. You've conditioned that response from the animal. Because when you're training, the dog does fuck off. And then the training is to get it to come back. So that's where the conditioning comes. And then it learns to come back for a treat. So there's always something involved in getting a reward uh, to a certain degree that you can limit that as you, as you go along. You can remove treats and things and it comes back. But it's conditioning. It's not necessarily the choice of that animal. And dogs are a really difficult one because you can beat a dog and it will still come back to you. Exactly. They're a really hard welfare. We've been in their lives for, what, 140,000 years. We've we've adapted. Dogs are our, are, are our best achievement as humans, I think. Dogs are fan-fucking-tastic. They are amazing creatures. Um, and so it's unfair to kind of um compare them because we've done so much domestication with dogs but again it is conditioning it's not that the dog you see you see it all the time people got no recall on the dog the dog fucks off it don't come back it's 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 got whatever it's got and it's gone and and sometimes they don't come back at all and they get run over and, and or lost or things like that so it's it's not necessarily a it wants to come back and for the same for the snake you let the snake out to go off and roam and it makes the choice of actually I'm cold, I need to heat up. So even though it's a choice, it's still a choice of necessity rather than um, a want. It has to go back to to get the heat. It has to. Whereas if it was a nice sunny day outside and you let your reptile go out, it's just going to bugger off. It's not, you know, it's probably not going to come back. You can train them too. Again, you can train them too. Bearded dragons, you see a lot of it. They they come back, but they recognise the people. They recognise you and associate you with food, good things that are happening to them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a choice. It means that they have to, to survive. How would you ever know what a choice is? Well, there you go. Unless you've got just the basic choices of, uh, you know, like food or something, you different types of of a thing you you can to get to the very nitty gritty of it you'll never you'll never really know could you then argue that, that any choice that we make is because we're conditioned to get something out of it that we value but so if we, if a choice you make to be with someone is because of the value they provide in being with them so but any any choice that we ever make is purely hedonistic it's what it does to benefit us any choice that we ever make is to make ourselves happy and it can, there is no such thing as a selfless act because you're doing it for your own benefit at the end of the day. Giving away a kidney makes you feel good because you've given somebody a kidney. And it's supposed to because we are a social species. We are supposed to get rewards from, from living like that, from, from, from choosing to be, to be moral and good. But just we can't say that just because no choice is really ever a choice, that that should be taken away. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You yeah, it's, it. it's like I do consent-based handling and I trained my beardies to come out and have health checks and things like that without me forcing it. But I'm not under any illusion that the reason they do it is because there's food involved. And so is, yeah, it really, yeah. is it really a choice or are they like, I want food, so I have to participate in this in order to get something out of it? Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's, it's the same with all locker room conditioning, uh, is, is whether there, there is, is that, it's, it, that is the illusion of choice. That is exactly the illusion of choice. We're not actually, which is why you should never, um, I'm not telling you what to do there. I'm just saying in general, um, when training animals, you should never offer a main meal as a source of no. uh, having to do something for it because that's completely immoral. Your treats, yes, but not a main meal of food. It shouldn't mm. be, which is why I don't do any training with my dog uh, for a main meal at all. I, She has her food. She knows she has to feel safe in that she will be getting food and she has a main meal and then treats to do training after perfectly fine, but never for, I'll never make it difficult for her to access a main meal food. Stupid dog. <laughs> she's, 
she's great really she's absolutely so fantastic you're you're like uh, us talking now like our own individual moral compasses at work here. i'm just trying to paint the picture for people so they, it brings it back around so our own individual moral compasses bouncing off each other and try, trying to understand what we all feel individually um some of us could feel like oh, we oh we can't justify this we can't justify that but then societally is very utilitarian and it does it does justify things and then the ethics comes in of like well you can't ethically say that you can't keep snakes if you're going to go ahead and eat meat as a society and yes, that's how yeah. am i am i getting like the big picture there is that the whole yeah, but that's the thing i can't say you can't keep that because I, I i fundamentally take away the main important right of an animal purely for my own pleasure because i like the taste of meat purely for that so i cannot say to anyone you can't keep you know this is wrong for you to do that because what i'm doing is wrong so I can't, I don't have the moral high ground to be able to, to stop them from doing it. But what I can do is try and argue the point for and hopefully get them to change their mind and improve in any way, shape or form. Um, in that sense, that's the best that I can do. And to be honest, being like that, in my personal opinion, has opened my mind up way more um to new areas than than ever before um i've got friends who are we're in the circus uh, industry a lot of circus animals he's got big cats now and when you mention circus to anyone it brings an immediate response of of negative and oh uh, you know bad bad and there is a, there is bad that happens in circuses uh, but there was also some good that happened in circuses operant conditioning happened a lot in circuses most zoos are based on circuses they started off as circuses uh in that sense you, you learn a lot more being open to everyone than being shut off and um cutting yourself off from certain aspects of animal history and you, you it's, it's so i'm so much better for going okay explain your where you're coming from and how you're doing things and things like that and you'll see start to see similarities and differences you're not going to agree with all of it you're not gonna nobody agrees with everyone on everything and there are some things that you can have well within your rights to say do you know what this is too much for me and I don't want to be a part of it and that's absolutely fine but to completely cut it off at the beginning it it's a shame it really is a shame history will repeat itself if if that keeps happening what i find interesting is that people will condemn one thing but they're okay with a very similar thing so like exactly. you're saying you tell most people performing animal circus people negative you go animal handling experience people are like great you're like that is the that same was, thing uh that was a part of my dissertation for the masters yeah. um i had to I didn't have to, I chose to do it. Um, I emailed every council in England and asked for the, how many animal activities license for performing animals do you have? Um, what animals are on there and the species? And it turned out there was close to 65,000 exotic species uh, for uh, animal encounters. Now, for circuses, when they were banned, um, there was a total of 42 exotic animals in circuses that were banned but yet we've got sixty-five thousand of them going around the uk at any given time and that's real fine perfect excellent if i can go up and touch that animal absolutely fine but you know if you're walking a horse around a stadium and i can't touch it no that's this is awful this is this is terrible this is this is horrid there is no there's no there's no there's no definition for circus either there's no definition for circus. That's one thing that uh, I found out. Another thing that I think happens a lot in in the hobby is that there's an element of people confuse their opinion with fact all the time. And rather than okay, oh my, oh my opinion differs than, than yours. I disagree. It's no, you're wrong. Sort of. I mean. An opinion is literally a preference and it can't be challenged. That's what an opinion is. So an opinion would be, I prefer coffee over tea. That's an opinion. You, you can't challenge me on it because it's literally just my preference. Whereas when somebody says, well, that's wrong because, or um, 
something like that. That that's that's not actually an opinion. It's 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 a false fact. They are making a statement with a fact, and whether that fact is true or false is can then be determined. So if I said, um, I think animals can feel pain, that's not an opinion. That's a statement. So you can tear me apart or build me up on that. Whereas, uh, or you saying, um, I don't think you should be allowed to keep that because of, that's a statement again, and it contains for either false beliefs or facts, and that can be torn apart. What you can't tear apart is I prefer leopard geckos over bearded dragons. That's that's an opinion. That's but if you said opinion. leopard geckos are better better pets than bearded dragons that's a statement that's, is it? A, that's a statement okay that's a statement okay. which which contains either false beliefs or facts and that's where the argument that's where you can just is that does that make sense yeah i kind of get it yeah an opinion is just <clears throat> sorry an opinion is purely preference so because people get it well that's just my opinion as if they're somehow immune to any kind of consequence of of that and it's, it's not their opinion they're actually stating a belief in a fact not not a preference so fuck mm. them <laughs> <laughs> see it, it's interesting because like i started thinking about like it was a while ago where i started to catch myself on like when something was opinion and when something wasn't because i think some people lean like or maybe i was wrong based on like a statement versus opinion and maybe i thought about it um, wrong in terms of like what the definitions are but like sometimes when someone was like they would state an opinion and what i thought was an opinion at the time i've got an example i'm just thinking about like how i felt back then um but i, I used to now i'm sort of like well i can't really like argue it's like okay yeah. cool you've said it and it's like well, well my opinion is this but that's as far as you can go yeah exactly yeah that's fine you just have a just... conversation about it but you can't be like yeah you're wrong <laughs> because it's just difference in opinion yeah, you can you and you can put your argument forward. They can put their argument forward, and you know there will be facts and myths in in each. And you, the best way to do in that is is talking it through. It, you, you just by shutting someone down immediately, you can't go beyond that, and it's not possible to go beyond that. So nothing comes of it. Nobody changes their mind. Nobody, you know it. Presenting somebody with facts is very unlikely to change somebody's mind. It was it was proven. Um, so going through philosophically and and the reasoning behind it is actually a really good way to get around that. Mm-hmm. But it's whether people are assholes or not to be able to accept the cognitive dissonance and say, okay, this is a new way. You don't even have to say I was wrong. You can say, well, that this is new evidence this is a new way of me thinking and i will take it into consideration from going forward and that's all you have to do you don't have to do anything else you don't have to completely change your mind you don't you know you don't have to burn all your clothes and move house it's just something as simple as that of okay let me stop and think about how your thinking of this can be so uh, helpful in 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 starting conversations like this because this is people automatically switch to um, blame and people don't like to be blamed. That's my cat's tail. Sorry. <laughs> people don't like to be blamed. So I, I think just... there's a lot of it that's like, Oh, your opinion differs from me. Then therefore you're an asshole rather than like, Oh, therefore they think differently than me. And that's it. Yeah. But then when it comes to the rights of other things, other sentient creatures, we can't rely on opinions. Perhaps. Here's a question for you. So when someone says, oh, n- there should be no wild caught, and someone says, well, I think that it's justifiable, and then someone says, Look, you're being naive for saying there's n- th- th- that you don't think there should be wild caught, can you really say that to someone if it's like, God, well, it's, it's their, op- 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 this is where I trip myself up in my understanding, full through, I think. Yeah, it's not an opinion. That's a statement. So when if somebody says, I don't find it justifiable, that means that they have a justification behind that. So they have to put that argument forward and you can either uh... prove that argument right or wrong. You just see what I mean? This, 
a fact is very hard to prove in in philosophy very very hard to prove um so you're not going to completely get there but you can find new ways of of thinking what what when doing that we're not you know when we're all slightly philosophical we have to be as a species but we're not all completely phd's in it so we don't have to get to the conclusion on everything it, it doesn't have to work like that but it does help massively i think a lot of us act out these things without knowing without even realizing we or even knowing what the definitions Absolutely. of these things are we're naturally like you, know, you justify that or naturally when oh it's just someone's got an opinion like people go through those motions without knowing what all the, de- the, the definite boundaries what all the definitions are um I don't know. Do you, do you find it's helped you knowing all the definitions and then helped you navigate that? Or do you think you've just been like in turmoil? <laughs> uh, half and half. Turmoil. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in turmoil most of the times, but it's it's difficult without a definition, without a solid definition that everybody plays off. It's difficult, but it also helps for it to be more fluid. And especially in law, that's important. So um basically you fucked either way so you just just try 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 your best some people can get definitions wrong um that's not helpful in in general that's when you can kind of try and um not change their mind but show them a different way again because if you don't have a an automatic definition that everybody agrees on it's it's really hard to 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 prove it so when it comes to law and stuff, um, I wanna let's go into I would like to ask you an opinion on positive lists are. Okay. So I'd like to ask you an opinion and then I was I'm also thinking of like when it comes to law and how this all plays into it, and people are very much like you can't impede people and you can't tell people what to do, especially when society's eating meat. Like how does this all play? How does this all work? Well, the thing about positive lists is they do try and be scientific, but it's difficult to what degree. So the positive lists that we've had in the past or ones that are def- have been put forward to the European Council, um, you know, they don't want people keeping king snakes, but hamsters are fine to keep. As Well, I mean, you could probably do a better job of providing for a king snake, a smaller species of snake, you've got more space, uh, adequate uh, dietary needs and things, than a hamster that's nocturnal and given the shit plastic cages, it's got nowhere to dig. It completely ignores everything that a hamster is. Why is it that more suitable than the exotic, the, the, the snake? And that's when you can pick a part of, is this animal rights? based on you cheeky little devils trying to get rid of certain species or is it based on science so between the um king snake and say the athuelas the ones that only eat morning geckos live morning geckos they don't do very well in captivity um they look like angry shoelaces Mm. do you know those kind of snakes i've seen them yeah Noodles. Um, obviously all wild caught because they didn't bring captivity. Um, they were all brought in, they were full of parasites, and all they wouldn't eat um fresh killed or frozen, they had to eat live geckos. So they justified this using this um uh life feeding method because otherwise the animal wouldn't eat, when really it was well that animal's not suitable for captivity, then is it? So you can't justify uh breeding and killing one animal to feed another when the truth is just simply don't keep that species in captivity so that's where positive lists come in handy for stopping that and there are species that just don't do very well in captivity and that is fine not everything is and we shouldn't necessarily you know we tried we've tried we've failed we've tried we've failed okay let's go try something different you know a different species is there a cousin of that 
we don't have to have these bloody angry shoelace snakes in captivity that are just completely unsuitable. I don't think that the ends justify the means of because one person can keep one successfully for so many months. It doesn't justify the thousands that have died to to get that one because there's no point of it being in captivity at all. So the utilitarian in- approach is like over the whole of how many, not just that one yeah. person can do it. Okay. You have to look at the big picture as it looking down on it as a whole, not just as a as a as a a general keeper thing. It's the point of keeping it in captivity, is there a point? If there's not, then the end cannot be justifiable. Because so no n- neither animal rights or utilitarian would justify that, basically. No. No, they wouldn't, no. Animal so that's is... where we can come to conclusions and write laws then, because there's no either end could justify it. Animal, yeah, um, we our, our laws are, are more and uh, they're more potentially based on utilitarianism. They're supposed to be, but they're also based more on um individual consequences as well. That's difficult to explain, and I can't think of the words. Uh, but they are supposed to be based on utilitarianism, but they can't all be because obviously that negates so in utilitarianism, for example, um, you know, if there's uh, five people, you've, you've five people who needed an organ transplant uh, and they were all good people, but there was one person who lived next door. He was a bomb. He had no job. He was uh, just a bad person in general. Um According to utilitarianism, it's absolutely ethically fine to kill that person, take his organs and give it to the good people to be able to, to because the end must justify the means. One person died to save five. So you can justify a lot of murder with um, utilitarianism. That's why it had to change a bit to preference utilitarianism where you couldn't actually do that. So you can't override um, the basic fundamentals, um, uh, human interests, uh, values interests and rights that's all interchangeable to be honest in, in, in my opinion um the word is interchangeable what people p- prefer to use but my my right to life does not um negate your right to life so i can't kill you to give me organs if i needed them i don't so don't worry but if it if, if it did it, in that sense that's that's why that's why it's slightly different in the law to to, to be able to do that whereas in animal keeping it's just main utilitarianism justifying consequences after justify the, the end do you know what this sounds like this sounds like you're very much like me like, i can see that you've gone down the rabbit hole because i've gone down the rabbit hole of like lighting and physics and the electromagnetic mm-hmm. spectrum of light and stuff but when it comes around to turning it turning around and explaining it to someone that doesn't know anything about it, you're like fucking hell where do i start yeah. I, I can see that in you. Also, and you're like, where where do I even explain this? <laughs> that plus I have ADHD, so it's it's like it was never meant to make sense. <laughs> <laughs> I had no no chance from the beginning, but I've i gone down the rabbit hole, and I did go down the rabbit hole. It, it, it's completely right, and to be able to understand it, it is more of a feeling than you just it, you just get it one day and go, ah, oh, fuck yeah, that makes sense. Mm. rather than um, all these journal articles explaining to you. Which there's like a structure in the measure, measuring mm. side of the sites and there's also the ethical side. of. So, well, again, you could say like, well, this paper describes that uh, UV has a big role on corn snakes. Mm-hmm. That is the, is the scientific fact. And I suppose like morally, someone could be like, well, I don't give a shit. So yeah. And it's the Why ethics I, that comes alongside it. That's the point, is making people care. Because whatever you say, people just will wash it off. How do you tell somebody, how do you explain to somebody why you should care? Because why, why does it, how does it affect me? Why should I give my snake UV? And the well, only reason that, that there is animal welfare is because the over, overwhelming majority of people care about what happens to animal. And that is based really on animal rights. And then the, then every keeper affords some level of animal rights. Yeah, there you go. Now you feel icky, don't you? 
no, 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 no. I've got over it. Don't worry about that. I, I've, I've, I've got over it now. But do you see what I mean? You do end up coming to, to um, a, a conclusion, a repugnant conclusion at some point. To, there's an even ickier one as well in, in utilitarianism with Peter Singer. Um, and it is icky. But it shows how morals really do affect you more than um, evidence. And uh, Peter Singer gave the, uh, he said, there's a, there's a brother and a sister and they're blood related. They're both adults, consenting adults. Uh, and they both decide that, you know, um, we should just mess around, have a bit of fun together. Um, they're both on birth control, so there will be no result in a kid. Uh, at all so no genetic issues or anything like that it would just be them two purely having fun um together and and then that's the end of it is that morally right or wrong and most people say well that's wrong and you explain why it's wrong tell me in words why is it wrong for them to do that and most well the brother and sister yeah but the whole point is that brother and sister because of creating yeah. messes of, of offspring well if that's not going to happen is it still wrong and you can't say shit yeah no it's not wrong you can go fuck your brother because it's icky it's fucking icky disgusting i, I think people that. say it's wrong because it makes them uncomfortable and that's like their own moral them... compass isn't it but there you go and that's what determines it at the end. So even though you've been presented with scientific evidence and facts and information, you've still gone with your moral compass and your gut mm. rather than the science. Because it was your moral compass that allowed you to follow the science. Exactly. Well, yeah, but the, the, I mean, it's still seen as icky. We, we have murder, death is seen as ick as well. Uh, it's it's an ick for for humans, so our moral compass we will always try and avoid that. But when there's no consequences to a certain action of incest, there's no consequences to it. They're not going to fall out over it. There is no consequence to this act whatsoever. It's not morally wrong. It can't be because there's no there's no consequence but we mm. still feel and that is that feeling that we have that overrides any logic or reasoning because the reasoning is there that nothing will happen it's absolutely fine but we still go absolutely not and even saying it out loud it makes me feel sick because no ooh, my, oh, my brother ooh, ooh. i don't even hug my brother so but do you see what I mean? I love conversations like this because it's such a mm -hmm. different level of conversation and it makes you just twist and turn, twist and turn. I like it. I want to go into the positive lists for you because I, 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 I can probably guess what I think your opinions would be, but I want to kind of challenge you um, and I'll ask you what you think the negatives and all the downsides to a positive list would be. Well... Um... A lot of them is underground keeping. Uh, that's a big issue because a lot of the species are already well established in the community. Um, another one to me is, again, it's just stupid. There's no real reasoning. There's no logical explanation or scientific reasoning why um, a Californian king snake would be banned, but a corn snake wouldn't. It makes no sense to me. I can understand them putting large reticulated pythons on i can understand when the size of an animal is just going to far outweigh any kind of enclosure that you can build for it um in general because there are people who do build bloody good enclosures um and then anything else, you know the, the, the dangerous things are on the dangerous wild animals act but it's just why it's a it's it's difficult to to come mm. through with a really good positive list without just basically it is a ban without banning in it that's 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 how it's come through but how can you control uh large pythons they're everywhere they're absolutely everywhere you're not going to ban them you're not going to get rid of them all it does is just stop people from giving a shit even more about them 
it rises the price up even more, which means they'll be bred more. You're doing the opposite of basically what the positive list is supposed to, to help was the welfare of the animal mm. on the of that particular species. And then there are some, I say, some species that don't deserve to be kept in captivity. Yeah, and that's absolutely fine. I don't I don't know whether we need a list because it, how is it going to be policed? You don't yeah. know what's in my home. It's nothing bad. I've just got two snakes. I promise. Swear to God. But there are many instances where people are keeping got like so many different things. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different species of animals in tubs stacked up in the house. And mm. how are you gonna how are you gonna police that? Because the local authorities don't give a shit about animal welfare they don't care and the rspca are unnecessary and that's that's a shame to say because they're a charity and we should not be relying on a charity because it's the fucking law it's literally the law it's what local authorities and the police and anyone anyone uh, can bring an animal welfare conviction against somebody else um for up to three years anyone can do it do you know how to go about um getting someone done for an animal welfare conviction most people don't. No, I so know what, like anyone can do it. Like you can yeah. literally. Where, where do you go? Those. Yeah. That's the that's the thing, isn't it? Google. And then when you, <laughs> you go to go to the local authority or the police, the police don't want to know. They don't give a shit. They've got other things to be doing. They're already understaffed. They don't want, you know, your mates, dogs a bit sad on top of everything else your local authority are very understaffed so they don't want to know and it's just one one person doing an array of jobs in the, it comes under environmental so they're doing all of the you know takeaway licenses plus the all the rat stuff and then animal licensing on top of that and they don't have a bloody clue they do not know so they dish it all over to the rspca who also don't don't know that much about exotics Mm. there's nobody you cannot enforce it in the uk it is uh, the complaints the complaints that we've made and um even from dangerous world keeping uh, unlicensed dangerous world animals um just some random dude who was keeping dangerous scorpions and breeding them and selling them um on facebook so it's you know knowledge that you can see it all and he's got kids in his house and he's letting these scorpions run across the fucking table and i'm thinking someone's gonna die someone's gonna die I better do something about it. So I contacted um, the local authority and she said, well, have you got his name? I said, this is his name. She said, have you got an address? I said, no. Said, well, what do you want us to do then? All right, good point. But still, <laughs> surely you should, <laughs> you should, you should look into it because I can guarantee if that man had not paid his tax, they'd know his full history, his blood supply and everything else. They'd know what he ate this morning if it was to do with tax, which is why I always tell people now, if there's anything to do with breeding and animal welfare, don't go down the animal welfare road, go through the tax, because the tax man will come and he'll bring bring everything with him, whereas animal welfare will not give a shit. They will not care. But if you owe the tax man on bred puppies or anything like that, you best mm. believe they're getting their ass done. <laughs> I hate it. I really hate it. But it's the only way that you can get any sense of justice. Well, this is the thing. Everyone says the RSPCA don't do anything. The problem is they have to rely on the police. The police are the ones that break in. The police are the ones that get the evidence. They have to. The yeah. police. Police are so, the ones who act out the warrant. They're the ones that the RSPCA can't do that. They are a charity. They have no more rights than me and you. But yeah. it, to be, they can bring private prosecution and they have the money to be able to get the good lawyers to be able to do that. So that's where they do come in handy. But again, if it's, they're stretched thin, there's only so much they can do. And they very rarely goes to court. It's so rare that it goes to court and that people are convicted. And it's sad, so sad, but what can you do? And like for us, it's like the when it goes to case, it's horrific for the animal. The animal has mm -hmm. to sit for years in a box until that verdict comes through, which is then what are you doing it for? Because that person gets a slap on the wrist and a 500 pound fine 
And you're yeah, like, if, 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 if that, if, if, if even, because obviously you have to, I don't think people understand you have to gather all the evidence. It has to go to the CPS. They have to decide whether there's enough evidence to prosecute or not. You can't just, you know, you can take someone to small claims court, but it's not in for that instance. And the, the horrific acts that we've seen, um, and some of them have been really bad. Uh, I'll just, in, in one naming of Tropical Inc., uh, when he was taken to court, he got a fine and he was still allowed to keep all his animals and still be able to to be an animal encounter company because it was his business. And I was not, I, I don't, don't I said I was not involved in that case and I do not know about the story. I've heard bad things about it and as I understand it, the guy got way over his head, which happens a lot. Hoarding is a very big issue in exotics keeping, a massive issue, especially in um, the animal entertainment side. It is a massive issue, animal hoarding. And you do easily become overwhelmed when you've got all that care. And then it snowballs as an effect so I, I, I can sympathize with these people definitely um but it doesn't necessarily mean I understand them because there's there's, there's ways of going about things etc but he got a slap on the wrist nothing more didn't take his animals off him because it's his business the animals that suffered no nah, you can go back just promise me you won't do it again all right I promise well, I'll ban you from keeping animals for 10 years who's who's gonna know what's in your house who's gonna know you've got snakes well, that's the thing, like, what does the ban do? Because you can go into a pet shop. No one goes, do you have a licence? Have you been banned? You've been banned. Like, it's the same with DWA. To sell DWA, I don't need a licence to sell you DWA, and I don't need to see your licence to prove that you can keep DWA. All I need to do is say, you know this needs a licence, and you go, yeah, and I should send the paperwork through to your, um, your uh, local authority just to say that this person's... But I don't need to see your licence for it to be legally sold, which is mad. And that's dangerous wild animals. I'd buy myself a tiger if I wanted to, that way. But it's, it's not enforceable because it, n- nobody enforces it. And all these laws, all these white lists, all these positive lists are fantastic on paper. And look how great we're doing as a country for animal welfare. And when it comes to enforcement, it means fuck all. We enforce nothing. For the sake, my worry is that people are already against taking exotics to the vet. And then you bring out a list. And then they won't take it to the vet because then they'll get pros. Well, their fear of being they prosecuted. They fear is that they're going to get prosecuted. But it's the same as <clears throat> going to the vets. Obviously, being judged by vets, and, and you need specific vets that can can look after those specific animals, which is an understandable concern of people when they're saying, you know, the veterinary care isn't there. But it is there. <clears throat> it is there. There are quite a few exotic vets that are willing to take, you know, these animals on and and look after them in that sense but it is fear of judgment as well and the cost of things especially nowadays with cost of living going up and the cost of veterinary care going up um people just don't have the funds to take the animals to the to, to the vets even if they would go through the um fear of being judged for keeping a specific specific series really because all you can say is i've had this since before the ban yeah which is what a lot of people did with uh, quietis and raccoons when uh, they came on the IAS. Is oh, I had these before the ban. How can you prove it? You can't. Mm. So, so what would you say the positives of a positive list are then? That's literally it. It's just that some species that aren't meant for captivity aren't allowed to be kept. But I genuinely feel like that's better dealt with as a hobby um, than as a law that's completely unenforceable mm. i think on that one can do good it's gonna take time because i think a lot of the people at the top are very old-fashioned in their views mm-hmm. that that's the problem is that we, we, we do have to wait for that new um the new the wave new, <laughs> the new wave of generation to come through and um it's starting i don't think it's quite there yet but it is definitely starting and it will it get there as a hobby if you if you think about it reptile keeping has well advanced more than any other animal hobby that has been around for a lot lot longer 
the husbandry has gone from, you know, in 30 years to animals not living that. for five months to exactly to keeping them for the rest of your lives sort of thing. So it's not that it can't be done. It definitely can be done. It's just whether the, the hobbyists are willing to accept uh, a lot of repugnant conclusions. So when we talk about like all of this in context of the concepts we've just had with like animal rights and whether you can morally justify it in the end, if it's unforceable and unchangeable, um, then it's just, it makes you uncomfortable, but there's not much you can do about it. That's the gist I'm getting. Well, that's, that's what it is. If you want to keep it, you can keep it. It's, there's nothing stopping you from doing that in, in, in ethics as an overall, it would, be not justifiable to keep the animals there's no real justification behind keeping this other than for your benefit for you what you want and that's the same for many species um so not just you know hamsters fucking hamsters um a lot of different cat breeds dog breeds especially where it's not justifiable to actually keep them uh but people don't want to hear that. And then it's down to you of whether you act that or not. But you can know something's wrong and still continue to do it. It's There's no ethics police, not in England anyway, that will come and knock your door and throw ethics water on you or something. I don't know. But that's, that's how it is. It's just because you do it doesn't mean that it's right. Same with law, just because it's legal doesn't mean that it's right. So do you think that the the people that are very, very extremist in their animal rights beliefs that oppose keeping reptiles altogether and are actively working against trying to, trying to stop it or at least diminish it, do you feel they're working towards something that they, they can't enforce anyway then? Oh, absolutely. It was, it'd never be enforceable. That's why bans haven't come in place. Because the government know it's, it's it's genuinely it's not very enforceable. The more you ban things, one it costs a lot of money to uphold that ban, and to for it to be enforceable, uh, and it costs a lot of effort that they cannot be asked. Animal welfare for the government at the moment is literally just a tick list to show that they've done something. It doesn't have to mean anything. It just shows that oh well we we've done it. Look we've done it. Gove and his fucking. Stupid traveling animals ban. Oh, I've banned circuses. No, you've banned 42 animals, but you've allowed 65,000 others. What's that ban done? Nothing for the welfare of animals. Virtue signaled. Exactly. That's all it was. It was a tick box to say, oh, we've done it. We've banned circuses. No, you haven't. You've just changed the definition of a circus. That's all. So mm. that's the same with with. I can understand animal rights and why they want to do it. They are fighting for the for the for the individual rights of the animals. That's a very noble cause. More to you, but it's is it enforceable? No. Is it logical? Not necessarily because we have. It's a part of our history as a species. We're involved with animals. We're not going to stop that. We're not going to. Cat, go away. Oh, he's going to beat me up. He really is. <laughs> it's because I called him Mr. Jingle. But um, you're not going to get rid of our interactions with, with, with animals. And it would be a fucking shame if it did. Because animals think... are fantastic. Sorry, Karen. No, that, that, was, that, was, that was the end. Animals are fantastic. I was going to say, do you think that as, as the right... The rights to life and the right to access to medical care and, and everything like that. Do you do you think it's questionable? You could also question yourself as to why you're pushing for something that might cause more problems for animal welfare than than the the current. Uh, it's hard to say. I mean. <sighs> When it comes to animal welfare, we are very utilitarian. So I don't know whether um, it would ever get that far. We are in, 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 
I promise in terms of of animal welfare as a as a whole especially when it comes to government and stuff we are very very um staunchly utilitarian and not animal rights animal rights doesn't really get listened to because it doesn't make money whereas animal agriculture and pets keeping and things it makes money so it will always be taken into consideration more than animal rights ever will it's the same with like animal lab stuff like yes it completely outweighs any animal rights yeah because we have sorry i'm just gonna plug my laptop in can i just um, ask where nugget is so I know underneath we... my chair okay cool well that's why i worked um i did um three months as a an animal lab technician in birmingham oh shit i've just pulled that out and that um in the biomedical department as um working with the mice uh, i was i was just an animal care technician so it was nothing um you know i didn't do any of the licensed activities or stuff i just wanted to see what it was like because if i was going to work in animal welfare i needed to see every aspect of animal welfare that was just a license i wanted to work under so i did three months and it was not what i expected at all um most of it is just keeping mice it's you know there was about five thousand mice and only about four of them were actually used uh the rest of them are obviously just in boxes and it was very very strictly controlled um so they had to be they had to have like two levels um they had to have um stuff to gnaw on they had to have diggable substrate they had to be kept in groups uh, and their welfare was actually better protected than in pet shops and that was because of they're used for for human human testing basically and checking out the genes and they didn't they didn't so they didn't really know any different it was uh, just thousands of just mice boxed mm. getting their waters changed twice a week and everything I'm grateful little sods I'll tell you that but, do you want to double but, back uh, but, to what you said about um about the government not listening to animal rights because it doesn't make money in our, in our country is staunchly no, utilitarian. The overwhelming opinion of like most reptile keepers um, is that we all think that the government's got animal rights whispering on their ear and they're like no. listening to it all. And it's they don't give a shit. Do you think they don't, they don't care? The, 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 that 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 makes me laugh the most um, because. I mean, most of the times when they're talking about, oh, the animal rights are doing this and that, it's not. It's animal welfare. And the animal welfare says, you need to treat these animals better. And they go, whoa, hold on. That's not really cool. That's not cash money of you to say. That's what they think is animal rights. It's it's not animal rights. It's literally animal welfare going, you're treating these like shit, treat them better. And they're going, hmm. How dare you take our hubby away from us because I can't keep a fucking snake in a box. That's what it is. When it comes to actual animal rights, when you're looking at the working groups and things like that, you will have them a part of there because they have to be a part of the conversation at least. But they're not necessarily um, given the time of day because, again, it's 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 not making any money for, for the government. And you, We're not talking a couple of quid. You're talking hundreds of billions of pounds of of revenue that's made by animal agriculture. That's why you'll never get rid of it because it's too ingrained in our society to, to get rid of. But you can try and make it slightly better because it hasn't always been shit. I mean, ethically, yes, but mass production has kind of made it a lot worse in that sense. I think it comes down to a lot of people working on animal welfare also have like very very strong um, animal rights beliefs to the yes. to the opposing end of like it shouldn't be kept. Yes, they do, but they also have the burden of proof uh, upon them, so they still have to present. So my my two my two um, uh, lecturers, one of them was uh, Dr. Stephen McCulloch, who is a a very well known and respected uh, European voice for, and he is animal rights, but. That man knows his science. Um, 
And Jesus Christ, does that man know his science? It's scary the way that he can argue back with 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 pure fucking facts. So even though he's animal animal rights, or what he would probably consider as animal rights, he can back that shit up uh, when it comes to, to any conversation of that when you're having. And then he always also a vet, I think. I think he's a vet. But my other one, Andrew, that's Andrew Knight, fantastic guy, lovely Australian bloke, dead fucking cool, love him to pieces, very knowledgeable, very more ethical, touchy-feely, a vet, but is for the vegan diets of pets, which is not particularly my viewpoint. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that, and I think it's against animal welfare, to be honest. But he's also a European um, opinion. So they come, you know, they come to these people for they're they're well ingrained within our animal animal welfare. They'll go to all of the uh, the seminars and, and and the government working groups and stuff like that. Um, but yes, there will be animal more animal rights based, but they do have to prove it. You can't. They're not just turning up with with a picket and going stop killing chickens. Chickens are our friends. That doesn't come into it at all not even slightly which is why the same as the opposite is also true when certain people uh, in the hobby of the older generation or something turn up and say oh they're the you know the staunch opposite of animal rights of you're taking away our rights of being able to keep that's why they're not listened to either because it's what argument are you putting forward where is your evidence so how do you feel that we come in the middle we have to have animal welfare science and animal welfare ethics together as a whole. It is a multi a multimodal thing, um, and we need um, the experts from all of the groups coming together and creating working groups, which is what usually does happen. You will get stakeholders in that as well, and there are people who who will have financial investments and stuff like that in 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 it going one way or another, and you'll never be able to stop that. But we are usually pretty good at listening to um, scientific evidence, especially when there's against involved. If you're saying, well, I'd rather you cut out this two billion pound pet industry, they're going to want to see some fucking evidence to be able to to justify that. They're not just going to go, all right, yeah, animals are sad. Okay, It's, it's not. What a stupid thing to think. Especially when you've got people who are also coming forward being like, no, it's justifiable, here's this, and oh, by the way, we can push the bar further and make people spend more money. Than- That's how they're trying to get past the animal welfare part, is by saying, well, we create £2 billion pounds of revenue. They can't they don't really have anything to back that up, to be honest. But shit is expensive, so I will give them that, you know, it, you know it's, it, it's true. For the high, but for the higher welfare things, it is expensive. But are we actually spending that much? I don't think so. I don't think so. I know I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it costs a fucking fortune to the, all of the the, the the gadgets, and and there are some gadgets that I don't think are personally necessary. I, I don't think UV measurers are necessary. I don't. I don't find them a necessity necessity at all. Uh, especially when they cost a couple of hundred pounds, and if you're just changing your bulbs every seven, six months or something, what, what? I don't, I don't get, I don't get why people have those. Because they last a lot longer than six months. That's why. Mm. Is it? I've worth saved it? so much money from having from having a solar meter. Just I to think... put under to say, okay, this is more than two, two, three. So I've had a T5, which you would normally have changed it, like after a year, Eight and. It's like the fourth year. No, yeah. really, yeah, and it's the same. It's not the same, it's but it's like dropped. Like, like, so I had a, a UVR like four point five from a B, and it's now getting to like three point nine. But I've just elevated the basking spot slightly, so it goes back up to like the fours. So I've still oh, got a four year old T five from my beardy. That's why they're worth money. <laughs> yeah, but for like three four hundred quid. It depends how many animals you have. If you have 30 vivs, it probably does make... Oh, well, there you go. Then there you go. Yeah, exactly. I didn't think of that. If you've just got, like, one, yeah, yeah. you've got 40 vivs that need UV changing, yeah, I can see how that's going to really come in handy. 
But when the beardy when the beardy's <laughs> UV goes knackered and it drops like UVR two, it goes to the snakes. And when it goes even more knackered, it goes to the hatchlings that lays on top. But it can be that close yeah. to that knackered. So every time I buy a new V, I only buy one bulb, but I don't replace the lot because they're just getting cascaded down. Yeah, but that's bloody brilliant. And that's why I shine a solar meter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I retract. I, 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 I completely and totally retract my statement. That's exactly why you should have a solar, a solar meter. <laughs> For me, it's got two snakes, not necessary, but... Fair. Bloody hell, I've had a bloody good idea to save money as well. You see, it can be done better welfare on less costs. Yeah, if you if you understand the equipment, you can really push push things further. Um, and I've even made videos about it, and there's people people that, have, that know it now because of this channel. So we're, we're pushing for it. But do you think we'll ever get to a stage where they will implement a positive list um, naively, even if it can't be enforced? Yeah, I do. You think there will be one? I do. I think they will. I think they'll go through with it. I think it'll be in the next eighteen months. Because we didn't think that they'd do it with um, the IAS either. And they did. And to be fair, give Chris his juice for that. He warned everyone and nobody believed him that it was going to go through and it did. Is that the AEL? Uh, no, that's the IAS, the Invasive Species. Oh, right. Invasive okay. Animal Species. So that's where they banned um, coatis and uh, some chipmunks and raccoons, which were big in the exotics community they were looking at banning some other stuff as well adding to the IAS but they didn't make it so so but that was uh, European based though Brexit might change that now well they just wrote it into domestic law even though it had fuck all to do with the UK uh, nothing to do with England raccoons were not an issue for us they were in Germany but not here they still just wrote it into um, domestic legislation so they're still banned for no reason so I'd like to ask your opinion of my opinion. Yeah, my opinion is I think the hobby should produce its own positive list because we're the only ones with the contextual understanding of what we keep, what's viable to keep without it to the detriment of the animal. Where, but I mean, like not like those gecko yeah. snakes and things like that. I think we should be making our own positive list ahead of time, and then when they do decide that they're going to make a positive list, be like there's ours, well justified. Do you think that as well? Yeah. I, I I think that should be done, whether it goes forward to government or not. I think the, the, that's the best way that this can be uh, enforced is literally through the hobby itself in talking to other people. And unfortunately, it does come with, well, why are you keeping that for? You know, times have changed now. We're not doing that anymore. And that's the only way that I think that it can be effectively um, uh, policed. I don't. I don't think that there's there's any other logical way to, to do this, and, and we have been doing it ourselves. We've, you know, there's a, there was a big part of getting rid of the um, the certain genes in uh, raw pythons that caused neurological issues and spiders and the, the spider morphs or whatever it was, and in the mm. carpet pythons. We've discouraged and them a lot. That's pre. That's been not too bad successfully in in the main ho hobby. People did stop for quite a while you're not going to reach the entire hobby in general because there's ones that aren't a part of the internet bases or still rely on you know purely just shops and things and shops have got a big part to play but it's we should have our own positive list and i think we start we, we will start to because if we don't do it someone else will and it's better if we do it and take accountability and put forward things than to wait for somebody else to do it because they will be doing it. 100%. You dictate rather than be dictated to, basically. Exactly. It's good. And it looks better to us as well, doesn't it? It does to say, actually, yeah, we've... And it's true. It's true. We've come back and decided, you know what, this live-feeding snake is not particularly good to be kept in captivity, so when, you know, this should be put forward for ban. Um, these just cannot be kept well enough in captivity, so they should be put forward for a ban. There are going to be times where someone can keep this snake perfectly, and it's great. But in general, as the general population, this cannot be kept well, and therefore mm. should not be kept at all. And that's utilitarianism. Do you think so? You, do you think they should be made and kept close to your chest, and when you find out they're going to do it, slap yours down, or just 
go ahead and like announce yours ahead of time so they go with it well, anyway you can ha- announce it ahead of time but it, either way it, it makes no difference it's unless there's specifically a um an issue where they're inviting for your opinion on then you can go forward and put it forward otherwise you know you, you can't just turn up to the government and say we're going to ban these it's there's, there's there's no one to nowhere to go to. It has to be a part of a working group. You think that the government listens to the voices of those that have are a stakeholder of the reptile hobby as much as they do to the reverse? Mm. Uh, mm. I think that the government listens to the people that make the most money. Personally, um, and what's going to cost the least amount to do. Mm. Uh, I don't really think the animal, uh, the, the government give a shit about animal welfare. I just don't think that they do. It's not big on their list. They've got other pro- other priorities to, to consider, and I don't think that they'll ever... I don't know how that's going to change with governments, obviously. I'm pretty sure conservatives are not going to stay in. I think that will change. I think potentially we will be looking at a Labour government next... I think it's just the way that how it's gone is, um, and I, I don't particularly know um, what Labour's, I think Labour are a little bit more towards animal rights than they are. At least with the Conservatives, you know, everything's down to money. Like, that's what you can tr- trust more of. If it's going to make you the most money, it's not likely to be banned. Whereas otherwise, it's a little bit different. With oh, ideology seeps in. Yeah, and I know the Green Party and things are quite animal rights based. They are quite staunch animal rights. Mm. Um, a lot. Well, a lot of them are. Whereas, I don't know with them. Um, Labour, I really don't. It's, it's a bit different than it per area as well. It's. So almost then, talking about whether whether it's enforceable or not, it doesn't really matter because it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, but if it's even if it's if you got if you got something in that's going to be banned, and, and it's better that we ban it and it not be actually banned, because at least then they can still access veterinary care whenever they want. It's no it's no issue on that. You just have a better pressure from the hobby itself than from the law where people are just going to go well fuck you I'll, I'll keep what I want so you're almost you're almost meaning like culturally we like try and embody a culture of like, these are things we want to keep and just that as our guidelines and suggestions yeah. rather than going to government saying here's the laws we suggest yeah but if we I'm saying if, if it's asked as a working group then yeah absolutely you can go up and say do you know what these are the ones that aren't doing very well let's keep you know these take these off the the good list of being kept uh, put these on a white list or something like that. I think that we can work together in that aspect and it can be very successful. Um, but it's gonna come. I know it's gonna, I know it's gonna come. It will come. Uh, and I just think it's better to be prepared than to it just be a big shock. Mm. So do you think like minimum size guidelines will happen before a positive list? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, well, they're coming in, aren't they? Uh, October, they isn't it? Supposedly. Yeah, October. Well, that's officially Which announced everything, that it's in law. Everything comes in in October, and I'm still waiting for some other things to come in. They're very sneaky with these Octobers, but it will eventually. Yeah, it will. it will come in. I, again, don't know how they're going to place that one, but, you know, who am I to say? Mm. That's just unfortunate. Uh... It just leaves you reeling, really, doesn't it? I don't know what to think. It, I think it's probably going to follow the same route as the Germans, where they were guidelines, and then yeah. these guidelines were things that you could be prosecuted, prosecuted against. Yeah. Like, well, you're not meeting that minimum welfare standard because you're not meeting that guideline. Because at the moment, but, it's for free. For no, all. that's the. But, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, most of the exotic mammals and things. I said not most at all. Um, some of the exotic mammals that come in um, 
they're called European specials, and that usually means they've come from Germany, uh, where they're bred quite prolifically over there. And they have some fantastic collections of exotic mammals that get brought over. Some really fucking good ones. So, but they've banned like a snake species or something like that. But you can transport over bobat marmots. That's fine. But no corn snakes or something like that. So it's it makes it makes no sense in a lot of it. I don't think they realise how many exotic animals are actually kept. Mm. That's what I think they're missing is a big part of the species and the number that is actually kept. Because it's fucking lots. Mm. And I've only got what's the numbers from licensed activities. And that's a lot, a lot. You know, this hippos and camels and lions and tigers and uh, there's some shocking species on there where you think, fuck, you know, how the fuck did that get here? What, but, animal encounters? Yeah, 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 yeah. So 60, 65,000 spe- uh, uh, species or just individual animals? Individual animals. So 65,000 individual animals in exotic encounters alone, let alone the rest of the industry. Yes, that, so that is literally just on what's available um, as a licensed activity. Mad. We, yeah, yeah, mental in it. I've got it. Hold on, let me just... Uh, I mean, and this is out of date now. See, how do you? You <laughs> can't enforce that. The, 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 the horse is already bolted. Uh Sorry, I've just come in a close up there, but I'm I'm, I'm gonna just grab something up so that maybe I did try and give this to people, but nobody was really interested. But the um I did get a lot of attention from media. They were messaging me asking for um for what I found, but I never gave it to them because they didn't know what they'd do with it. So the number of exotics that go around, sorry, is 31,000. 269 and that's just from what the um the local authorities that replied mm. Mad. i think when you go through all these like this mental exercises and you think things through to me it's already led to a state of like apathy and i've been like oh i don't know i don't know if that's a common trend with people that did the course or anything well yeah I suppose. I mean, it can be. So I really don't know what's going to happen in terms of animal welfare. Then, if if, if you're certain, I'm I'm fairly fairly certain that a positive yeah. list will come, I um, will. and I don't know what the fallout's going to be. The fallout will be what the fallout will be. It. I'm afraid that's where the apathy comes into it at this point. Now I just think, do you know what? What? Fuck it. What you've had your time. You've had your time. You were supposed to get back. You didn't. You're still standing on a soapbox, giving slippery slope arguments and not giving a shit about animal welfare. You deserve it. You deserve this. What do you mean by slippery slope arguments? The, well, you know, when they, they're they going to take a hobby, what are they going to take next? Are well, they going to ban it all? You know, when they come in with an argument of, we shouldn't keep this because of X, they're immediately going to go, they're trying to ban the hobby. This is animal rights propaganda. It's always animal rights propaganda. Animal rights propaganda. They're coming for your cats. It's always that. And it's it's sometimes the case. Sometimes, a lot of the times, it's not the case. Mm. Yeah. it's. I don't want to... It, it leaves people jaded to work with them. I don't want to work with them. I don't like them. I don't. I don't. I, I think that... They're just not worth my time. They don't give a shit about um, qualifications yeah. either. That, that's the whole reason why, uh, you know, to be able to go to somebody, well, I've got a qualification in this, at least this gives you some guarantee to know what I'm talking about. They don't give a shit. They just go, oh, anyone can get a piece of paper. And I thought, three years of my life and my mental health for that degree, and they still didn't listen, so I went in for the Masters. I don't, I don't know why. I thought maybe that would make them listen, but uh, no. I have the same feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when I see the amount of debt, I'm like, why did I do that to myself? Why the f- 
I say debt. They keep sending me that SL student loan thing around and I'll just laugh, throw it in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> you should be more responsible with your money. <laughs> <laughs> I did this entirely without ever thinking I was going to have to pay it back. So, you know, it is what it is. Exactly. <laughs> Next time, be more responsible. Why well, lend young people a load of fucking money? It's your own fault, man. You've got no <laughs> sense. You deserve this. Now suffer. <laughs> I think last time I sent them back a coupon for TJ Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Just take this off the bill, will you? <laughs> oh god um yeah i think i personally have got to a state of like apathy of i bought what's best for the animals if someone can justify limiting things and feel that they can like control yeah. it whatever the animals that i have are some of my snakes will live at least 60 years they're not going to take those animals away from me or as long as that doesn't happen, then what am I upset about? Like, I'm content and I feel yeah. like that. I'll just Somebody said to you tomorrow, like, we're going to ban animals keeping all together. How would you feel? No one's allowed pets anymore. How would you feel apart from domestics? It's difficult because, like, I would be upset that they were going to take my animals away and PTS them. But if that wasn't going to happen, then I would be fine. That wasn't, yeah, that wouldn't happen just from now on. Um, everything that you've got has grandfather rights, but you can't keep anything else from now on. Would you keep any more from now on? Um, I think I would be at the state of, like, fair enough. Like, if that yeah, means yeah. that all the animals that I know suffer aren't going to suffer anymore, then I'll, yeah. I'll be content. And like there's, yes. like say grandfather rights, there will still be tortoises in two hundred years. Like yeah. that doesn't selfishly, it doesn't affect me. It affects the next generation. And but yeah, it's just you just that's all you can say to it is yeah. I've reached a state of ugh. yeah. It's just an exasperation, and the people who need to be there. I'm not going to include myself in that, but people like you guys, you're getting worn down by it. And you can only take so much before it starts to really affect your mental health and you have to leave for your own benefit because you just can't take it anymore. And it's it happens, unfortunately, a lot. So there's no one left to fight for it, just the ones that shouldn't be. So I think... I've, I the benefit of this is that we make money from it so i'm more content with it i think i suppose yeah mm. that is a i mean making money is a general nice thing to do what's it like that's all right actually positive list will come in we should do it in our own hobby first but we're all tired but also you got to think about um you create a list so large that it's basically not a positive list anymore and you might as well not buy anything because yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say I, I genuinely couldn't think now maybe three or four species i know definitely not large large-bodied snakes i'd take off anacondas retics pythons the the big ones um the any live eating snakes which is just the angry shoelace ones but i can't think of anything but much else that's like really bad because all the shit stuff that's been kept badly is the good species though so like cord snakes and bearded dragons and things like that those are good species to keep they're really good good key species to keep but they're the ones being kept badly because there's more of them so I think the compromise is if you look at the Belgian positive list, there is the list, which is no questions asked. You can have this. Then there's the ones in a separate provisional list where it's like a veterinarian has to look at your house to see if it meets the minimum housing guidelines before you get the animal. And if they pass it, you can have it. So you could put giants on that provisional list and that's the compromise, not a complete ban, but you would need to just whack them on the DWA. There's that as well. Just whack them on something that's already in place. Yeah, for me, like 
some of the decision like why retics aren't on a dwa is quite confusing to me because like some of the other things like for example an otter you're like eh. it's it's what they base it on kind of like what's what how many accidents there are the causes of accidents so with otters there's been a few where they've bitten people's fingers off um because you know that's an otter that's what not otters do otter things um but there's no real um evidence bar some s- speculation and maybe one case of, of a giant snake killing someone in the UK at least um but if you actually look at the DWA statistics I think there's been like maybe one or two um people that have actually been killed by DWAs in the 40 something years 40 50 years I can't count backwards that the the license has been there's been barely any incidents Mm. whereas every year there is quite a few deaths from dogs uh, cattle and cats tripping over the bastards um there's even <laughs> choking on napkins and stuff you know there's deaths from that but not with dwa is but yeah they're on the list but it's, it's just an already existing list that has a set of rules in place that most local authorities are aware of and it can be manageably done or you know what would be even better is if local authorities started hiring qualified people in animal welfare. Could you imagine? Could you imagine that actual qualified people in animal welfare who knew the law and shit? Wow, <laughs> what a world! What a world! But no, they're not going to do that because they don't have the budget to do it. Mm. But food for thought for a lot of viewers. Um, whether you reach the stage of apathy, we've just just got to. If you don't get to the end of this and you're like well then uh this then is you... depressing <laughs> <laughs> right and on that note i think we are it's half four now so we've been going for a long time so um the question from the last guest was um about minimum size guidelines um but we've already really covered it so um thank you so much for coming on jen oh also yes. Um, a random question for the next guest. You won't know who it is. A question that you would like to ask the next guest that they'd have to answer. What's the lethal dose of hedgehogs? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much for coming on, Jen. <laughs> That's okay, no problem. <laughs> thank you again, Jennifer, for coming on the podcast. This was a really good conversation. Um, and it's just a lot of food for thought for a lot of people, whether they agree or disagree with some thoughts expressed in this episode it's really healthy to um have other people that might challenge the way that you think and help you grow as a keeper or a person on how you even like think about things in terms of the hobby so i certainly found it helpful for myself and i think other people will too so so thank you so much for listening through all of this and being a part of us in this conversation if you want to help us and support us making the content of this show then you can head on over to patreon slash reptiles and research But other than that, we'll see you in the next episode.